folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2015 with another Watchman video broadcast. Actually, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. This is Pure Bible Study Watchman broadcast. It's like peanut butter and chocolate all brought together into one, all right? Um, and the reason being, as I've been dealing with the book of Revelation for like, I don't know, the past I don't know, 15 years in the Pure Bible Study, hasn't gone on that long, uh, but I like to be thorough. We look at uh, each individual thing given to us in the book of Revelation. If you've been following this, you'll know that I have been dealing in the book of Revelation for several years now, working our way through methodically, trying to understand what we can from the Word of God. And we were in Revelation chapter 13. We had dealt with various issues about the beast and so on. Now we're at verse 11. The Bible says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And I started looking at that, and I, for a while in the Pure Bible Study, I've been dealing with how to identify false prophets because, I mean, you just go through all through the Bible, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy uh, 18, you look at Balaam, uh, you look at uh, Ezekiel 13, uh, the book of Jeremiah, all the places in the Old Testament where God warns about prophets who are saying things that God never said but making people think that God said it. Then you get into the New Testament. You hear Jesus teaching us to beware of wolves who come dressed in, in, in sheep's clothing. Paul talked about it as he was giving sort of his parting instructions. There in the book of Romans, he said, after I leave, there's going to come in grievous wolves and they're going to try to destroy the flock. Then we have the teachings of Peter and Jude in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2 and Jude, who just for some reason, I guess by the Holy Ghost, they're almost saying the exact same thing. They're a double witness on how to identify false prophets, what their nature is, what their character is, um, what they will say, what they will do behind the scenes that most people won't know. But you'll be able to tell that this is what they do because this is who they are. The fact that false prophets are not Christian people. They're not saved. God said, I won't write them in the writing of, of my people. I won't put their name in the book. And so anyway, we've been dealing with this for quite a while. And I got to Revelation 13, 11, and I was looking at this idea that he had two horns like a lamb. Now here's what just jumps right out at me, is that you have a real lamb over here in Revelation chapter 5. Um, the Bible talks about, uh, yeah, here it is in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. You notice in your King James, the word lamb is capitalized here. And this lamb has seven horns. It's a little weird. To us, we're used to seeing... Uh, uniformity, evenness, we're used to seeing is even on deer. Okay, We count deer by points. It can have three points over here and three points over here. Well, that's a six-pointer, we call it. may have four over here and four over here. Well, that's an eight-pointer. Every now and then, some guy will come dragging in a seven-pointer. It'll have four over here, three over here. It happens, all right? But here we have the Lamb. This is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, capital L. Translators knew who it was. We know who it is. He has seven horns and seven eyes, and those are the seven spirits of God. I just, I like this analogy. Think of Samson when you think of the seven spirits of God. And, and how, many, how many horns did Samson have? How many locks of hair did he have? He had seven. He's, he's playing the part. Playing the part of Jesus in this movie would be Samson. So we have this lamb here. He is the real lamb. He is the prophet, capital P. He is the uh, angel of the Lord, capital A. He is the great bishop, capital B. He is the chief apostle. Um, he is the great shepherd of us, capital S. All the, all the offices that can be seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that of priest or prophet uh, or king or apostle or preacher, all of this, the mighty, uh, the, the angel of the Lord, the high priest, all of these offices that we see throughout the Bible, Jesus is the chief of every one of them. Now we have a false prophet, and we know that's who he is because he's called that later on in the book of Revelation. He's called a false prophet. 
We see him showing up in here having two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And I remember thinking about this and, and just kind of meditating on it and just sort of trying to get an idea of what this looks like. And I, I actually looked up, you know, what the horns on a lamb would look like, what, you know, how they're formed and things like that. And then it, something clicked. Something just occurred to me that we have actually, in our generation at this time, in our culture, we, we've seen this. We have seen these two horns like a lamb. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a risk here because some people, all they do is look for something in my videos or other people's. They're just waiting for me to do something funny with my hand so they can say, he's in the Illuminati. He just flashed his brethren. There's already a website out on that. Anyway, I'm going to show you how you and I have been seeing the sign of these two horns. Are you ready? It's like that, okay? Now, I, again, somebody's going to go, see, Hoggard's flashing signs. I'm doing that to illustrate for you. You've seen it before, right? You've seen this sign before. And I'm going to show you some of the places that this sign shows up. And a lot of people would say, well, that's, you know, this is the symbol of the devil. That's the symbol of Satan worship. Or that's Satan's horns and things like that. Technically, and the Bible's a technical book. According to the Bible, the dragon, according to Revelation chapter 12, the dragon doesn't have two horns. He's got ten. So it just, it just seems to me that when people are making this sign that there's something being indicated here. And I do believe that there are some people who knowingly will flash this sign. Let me give you an example of this. Here is... Anton LaVey. He just doesn't look like preacher material, does he? This is Anton LaVey. He is the founder of the First Church of Satan in California Street. Welcome to the Hotel California. That, yeah, that song, Hotel California, was about the First Church of Satan, California Street, San Francisco, California. Of course, it had to be in San Francisco. Anton LaVey is pictured many times flashing this sign. It's the two horns uh, that he makes with his first finger and his little finger. You can see him there um, with his head in front of this particular pentagram. It kind of makes it look like he's got two horns coming out of his head. And I want you to notice his left hand. He is once again flashing that sign. Here is a close-up of that particular pentagram that Anton LaVey is posing in front of. And you can sort of understand the idea of a pentagram. We've talked about this um, in many, many of our videos, many things that we did. It just occurred to me one day that the pentagram being a five-pointed symbol actually represented something with the number five that just dumps, jumps out at us. Uh, we know, according to the Bible, we know that there is a God who has power over death. And I mean God, little g, not big g, God. Little g, God, who has the power of death. That's the devil. That's Satan. Here in Isaiah 14, the Bible's telling us that the devil has this five ideas, or these five, five fingers of death. He has this, uh, this plan that he wants to enact. Um, the Bible says in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. The congregation. You think about that. The congregation. He wants to rule over the congregation. Sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Last thing there that he says. Seven words in it. Does it mean something? We're going to check it out here in a little bit. All right? But this pentagram. That's what it represents. The number five, I mentioned number five being associated with uh, Satan having power over death. The number five associated with death. In Genesis chapter five, you have Adam mentioned in verse one, two, three, four, and five, one time apiece, five times. Fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. 
He has a son, Seth. Go to Genesis 5. Count how many places, how many times his name is mentioned. Five times. Fifth time he's mentioned, he dies. Moses died in the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five books. Moses died in the fifth book of the Bible. Romans chapter 5 tells us that, that death reigned from Adam to Moses. Adam dies, his name's mentioned five times, dies uh, in the fifth book of the Bible. Moses dies, or excuse me, the fifth chapter of the Bible. I'll get it right. Moses dies in the fifth book of the Bible. So the number five here in this instance represents death. We know that Christ has power over death now because he was pierced one, two, three, four at his feet. I'm not going to put my feet on the desk. The fifth time he was pierced in his side, blood and water issued forth. And he said, he says before that it is finished and he gave up the ghost. Christ has conquered death. He's conquered that enemy called death. And the devil has that kind of power. Now, the devil has an agenda. He wants to rule over the earth. He wants to rule over the congregation. He wants to rule um, over all of the angels in heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God is what he said. He wants to sit on God's throne. He said, I will be like the Most High. So the way I see it, everything of an evil nature that goes on in this world has to have something to do with that five-point plan, it, exalting Lucifer as the supreme God sh being exactly like the Most High, or trying to be like the Most High. And so whatever plans are afoot, they go to feed that particular purpose. So in steps the false prophet. The false prophet's job is to, and you know, we could look ahead in Revelation chapter 13, um, he causes everyone to build an image to the beast. He causes everybody to worship that image of the beast. He, he deceives people with lying signs and wonders, even fire coming down from heaven. Then he's the one, the false prophet. I want you to get this. The false prophet is the one who is causing everyone to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. A lot of people seem to, and I've done it, have this, this conception or this idea that these evil beast powers are going to take over the earth and nobody, everybody's afraid and they're all getting dragged, kicking and screaming and threatened with their life to get this microchip in their skin or this tattoo or whatever some people think it is. But that's not really true according to the scriptures. It's not the beast that makes everybody get the mark. It's the false prophet. And he doesn't force anybody to get the mark. He causes them. He uses his powers of deception, his powers of persuasion. He uses the way that he speaks because he speaks as a dragon speaks. He uses everything available to him to not force, but cause everyone to receive a, a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, think of this number five and the, the pentagram and Lucifer's five-point plan and signs that are made by the hands. And there's many different signs made by the hands. There is the live long and prosper. Leonard Nimoy just passed into eternity and had to stand before God who did not tell him live long and prosper. But Leonard Nimoy will tell you, and he actually did a video on this, that he got this sign that he used in Star Trek. He made this famous and everybody's going around, Trekkies go to, go to Trek conventions and that's how they give each other the sci fi Hey, how you doing? Okay. And so anyway, but Leonard Nimoy says, you know where he got that from? He got that from when he was a Jewish boy in the synagogue and his, everybody had to bow their heads and close their eyes so they couldn't see as the rabbi gave them this hand gesture blessing here. I've talked about this in some videos. You know what this is? Three over here and three over here. 
okay, six together. That's what that represents. Genesis 6, um, the idea of the sons of God and the daughters of men, that's that's what that gesture means. But many things can be done with the hand. You give this the, the, the two horn signs, or you can thumbs up, or you can whatever. You can give these various gestures using the five fingers and the hands, and they all mean something. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But we commonly associate this, this gesturing of, and I'm going to make this gesture several times. Please don't be offended, and please don't think that I'm getting a paycheck from the Illuminati because I'm doing it, all right? Uh, but anyway, they, they will take it. You'll see this sign made quite a bit in this world. Primarily, where do we see it? Rock and roll. Now, I want you to remember, as we go through this, I want you to remember, the devil has a plan. The false prophet's job is to aid and abed that plan. His job is to put every person on the earth, young and old, rich and poor, free and bond. There's actually six groups of people here, okay? Six groups. Anyway, uh, his job is to bring everybody to a place where they will willingly accept this mark in their right hand or in their forehead. We're going to understand what the, what the symbolism of these horns represent and exactly what this gesture means. And when you see this gesture being used, when you see it being made, rest assured there is a spiritual aspect behind it. There is something that's, if you know, according to the scriptures, what this means, when someone makes that sign, you'll go, I get that. I know what that is. That is the spirit of the false prophet leading people through whatever they're doing this with. Let me give you some examples. We mentioned rock and roll. Rock and roll, devil's music. It is. Does that mean I hate rock and roll? To be honest with you, my flesh, I like southern rock. That's, that's my flesh, all right? Leonard Skinner and the Eagles and some of these other things. I mean, I didn't listen to it a lot as a young man, but I heard it, and there's parts of it that I like. Okay, just being dead honest. But I'm telling you, the themes, the nature, the lyrics, the dark moods that a lot of rock and roll music presents, the impulses and the urges that rock and roll encourages people to delve into, I'm trying to say this politely and nicely, all of that is part of the package of the false prophet leading everybody to this place, this time in this place when they will willingly receive a mark which is like a seal upon them that they belong to Lucifer. And if you think about it, when you see like Anton LaVey, again, making this hand gesture, you go, Okay, he's not a member of uh, First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, Faith Church. He's not a member of these churches. He is sold out and sealed by the devil himself. Anton LaVey is dead. And in hell, he did lift up his eyes, being in torments. He worked for the devil in his payment. His eternal suffering and torture um, that never ends. Uh, Anton LaVey started using this. Then we have, as far as rock and roll is concerned, we, one of the first groups to ever use this was a group called Coven. Here's their album cover. Usually, most people describe this as one of the first places it shows up on a rock and roll record. And the title of this album is Witchcraft Destroys Minds and Reaps Souls. You see, they named their rock and roll band Coven after the gathering of witches. Why? Was it just some marketing ploy where they were just trying to make a buck? Or were they actually trying to promote an idea and a, a philosophy? Were they working for the spirit of the false prophet? I mean, here they are making the hand gestures. By the way, you say, well, I never listened to Coven. I didn't listen to that stuff. You remember the movie Billy Jack? You remember that movie? <laughs> pretty cool movie. I mean, the time when Billy Jack said, I'm going to take this foot and put it behind that ear, and he does it. Okay, I remember that. You remember the theme song to that movie? Go ahead and hate your neighbor. Go ahead and cheat a friend. Remember that? That's Coven. That's who sang that song. Okay, so 
yeah, you've probably heard some of their music before. But they were one of the first ones to start promoting this idea of these two horns and, and this hand gesture representing these two horns. And I think that the two horns here and this gesture, not so much representing Satan himself, because we know from the Bible he's got ten horns, but actually representing this other beast that comes up from the earth having two horns. We're going to get into what these two horns represent from the Bible as well. Here's some just some random pictures that I picked up from the internet of people making this gesture. Some of these people I know and some of them I'm pretty sure are famous but I don't have a clue who they are and that's what's in this picture here. Now I'm sure this guy uh, being associated with Life Magazine and EMI Records. I'm sure this guy is quite famous, but I have no idea who he is, but he's making the gesture. And if there was any doubt of the evil nature of this gesture, I mean, this guy's tattoos just kind of spell it all, doesn't it? Okay. Um, ladies, let me just kind of help you out here. A guy with tattoos like this, not a father figure for you children. Okay. He's just, I just, you know, maybe I'm judging, but I don't know. It just looks like that he loves evil things more than he loves godly things. So you might want to watch out for that. All right. Anyway, oh, here's some more here. There's Katy Perry, who used to be a Christian, but she said in a video interview that she guesses she sold her soul to the devil. And here are some other famous Holly weird actresses posing with this sign. Uh, here's Britney Spears in the background. And another guy that I'm sure is quite famous as some sort of record album or something like that. And I have no idea who he is. And some of you are going, oh, yeah, that's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, that guy. Okay. Uh, but we all know who the Beatles are, don't we? And I want you to take a look at these two Beatles albums here. Uh, the Yellow Submarine album. You notice that Paul McCartney is making one sign like this. Okay? And you, you might think you know what that means. Hang on. And of course, John Lennon, who is dead now, and so is George Harrison, doesn't sound like they're all going to get back together anytime real soon, but maybe in the next 20 years, they'll all be together. Get my drift? Anyway, John Lennon, and he's making a sign similar to this, but if you look over there at a painting of them, and of course you see John Lennon there in the background making the gesture of the two horns protruding into the air. And again, think about it. Think about, think of, ask yourself the question, did the Beatles have any sort of influence in the days of the 60s, the 70s, and my goodness, even to this day, Beatles albums, when they're sold, and they come out some new Beatles album of like, a, you know, just gathering together old songs, put them on a new CD. People rush, they buy the things. Did the Beatles ever have any influence in this world? Did they influence people with their lyrics, with their music? Did they influence people with their politics, with their philosophies, with their religions? Did they have any influence whatsoever? The, you'd have to be dumb to say, ah, oh, no, they didn't influence anybody. Of course they did. And they showed the sign of that influence. And I'll explain that as we move on. Oh, yeah. There's Hannah Montana herself. Now, this picture is obviously cropped because the rest of it is pretty bad. Um, she's got her tongue sticking out like a serpent. And she's twisted her hair up to look like two horns protruding out of her head. There's Ozzy Osbourne there in the upper part in the background. Here are, again, a couple of people. I think this guy over here with the horn sticking out of his head, I think that's Eminem, but I'm not sure. I, and I don't really care, okay? It's just some really rich guy, sold his soul to the devil, sings some pretty vulgar music probably, and he's showing you the spirit that he has. He has a spirit that works through him. What spirit is that? It's the spirit that has two horns like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. You think about that. 
Oh, there's Justin Bieber. We all know who that guy is. And there is uh, Gene Simmons of Kiss making that. We all know who that is. And there is British pop singer George O'Dowd. His stage name was Boy George. I've told you. I kind of blush at it, a little embarrassed by it, but the first time I saw Boy George on Dick Clark's, what is it, uh, whatever he did, Rockin' New Year's Eve or something like that back in the early 80s, I'm going, boy, she has a really good voice. Then I found out it was a dude, all right? But she's, he's wearing his hat with his little horn sticking out of it. Ronnie James Dio, and some of you are going, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I remember those days. Ronnie James Dio, basically that was, that was his sign. I mean, if anybody tried to own it and use it as their sign, Ronnie James Dio did. And Ronnie James Dio, and I didn't listen to any of his music, but I did a little research. And apparently, out of all the people who were the best front men for any heavy metal group, Ronnie James Dio probably goes down as number one, number two, number three, depending on who you are, okay? So this guy, he made his mark. He's dead now, and in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Why? Because he had a spirit, a spirit that was working through him. Was it a good spirit? No. Let me look at his album cover. My goodness! He's got this devil thing coming up out of the ground with the horns, making horn signs on it, throwing, uh, tying a Catholic priest up and throwing him into the water. It's, you kind of get the idea, don't you? I mean, they, they use the idea of a Catholic priest because they dress in a clergy manner. So that's really the, the idea here, is that the power of these two horns is conquering over what they perceive as Christianity. Does that kind of influence then in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the O's and the O-teens now? Absolutely still there. Um, by the way, and uh, Dan Brown talked about this in, uh, what was it, Angels and Demons. There's a way that you can write Angels and Demons that when you turn it upside down, it says Angels and Demons. It says the same thing. Here, the artist took his last name, Dio, and turned it up. When you turn it upside down, you can see the letters D-E-V-I-L. And it does kind of make sense. I mean, and you can say, well, you're kind of making that up. Listen, he played rock and roll music. He worshiped the devil, even if he didn't do it like going to a satanic ritual. His God was Lucifer, and he was being controlled by a spirit represented by these two horns. And then, then, everybody's getting in on it now. The 57th Annual Grammy Awards. The attendees were all given these plastic horns with these little battery-powered lights in them in honor of ACDC singing at the Grammy Awards. And everybody's going, yeah, rock and roll, woo, ACDC, man, we're putting the horns on. We're like a highway to hell. It's all fun and games, isn't it? And then there's that good Christian, Bono, 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 Sonny Bono. No, they're not related. Bono from the group U2. He's supposed to be a Christian. Some people think he is. I think that there is a different spirit that works through him, symbolized by the gesture that he's making on stage. And then who can forget Madonna? Performing somewhere over in Europe, I think, with all of these guys that are, all these male dancers that are wearing horns, two horns like a lamb. And you remember she had a wardrobe malfunction and she, well, she had a falling away. She fell backwards. Think about that, all right? And so, I mean, that, we're just, I mean, you could probably go to, I mean, you can go to Google image, you can go to Yahoo image, or you can go whatever image source you want to go to and type in devil horns hand gesture, and you're going to get a ton of pictures of people in rock and roll groups, people at Academy Awards, people in parties. You'll even see it, believe it or not. 
I used to have a, a collection of clips. I don't know where I put it, but I was recording Christian rock videos where that hand gesture was very prominent. And I knew it was related to like the devil thing and so on. I just didn't make the connection that I think that that two-horned hand gesture represents the two horns like a lamb of the false prophet. But now that I see it, it makes a lot of sense what we're doing and what we're able to do. It's like that way with any sign. First time I saw the Triketra on the front of a new King James Bible, I went, what is that? I've never seen that before. I don't see that in our church anywhere. Never saw it in a church. What is that? Thomas Nelson says, oh, that's the, you know, for the Trinity, obviously. I mean, it's on a Bible, right? It's for the Trinity. Then you read the Bible that we ought not to th think that the Godhead can be graven with art and man's device. God said there is no symbol for the Trinity. So what does that mean? And we want to know what that means. And once you find out what the symbol means, like the Triketra, things just start clicking into place when you see it and wherever you see it. Marilyn Ferguson's Aquarian Conspiracy, there it is there. On a, on a witch's book, a book of shadows, there it is there. You start making the connections. Here's the same thing. You start seeing the two horns of the false prophet and you start immediately thinking of the influence that's represented by who or whatever is making that sign or that gesture. Now, Something that I'm going to bring in here, something that we did, um, I'm trying to remember, we did a couple videos um, here a while back on witchcraft and the power of witchcraft and so on, but also when we were talking about what CERN represented, you remember the Large Hadron Collider, and it, it occurred to me, just kind of doing the research, it occurred to me that the name CERN was a shortened form of a particular god that had horns, Sarnunos. This is the god, the male god of Wicca or witchcraft. They believe in two deities. There is a male god who has two horns coming out of his head. Then there is this female goddess, and they're both equal in power. And the idea is that when you can, when you can bring them together, like Shekinah and Yahweh in the Kabbalah, when you bring them together, that's when all this great, amazing power comes out, the Shekinah glory that you hear some people talk about. Anyway, that's what that is. But there has been a horned god all throughout history. This, this graphic that you see here, uh, I think, is from some of the northern European, Scandinavian-type countries. They had this deity uh, with these stag horns on his head. There is the horned god of Wicca. This is actually a witchcraft or Wicca museum in England, and they have this representation of the horn. Notice this is a ram, which is like an adult lamb. This is the two horns that you see in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. We go back in history. We see all these deities in these statues of a the representation of a horned God. It goes all the way back into Babylon. It goes into ancient Samaria. All throughout the world, you're going to find some sort of reference of a God that has horns and animal, beast horns coming out of his head. What does that mean? This beast is a spirit, and this spirit has been around for thousands of years, and that spirit has been influencing people with religious ideas, spiritual ideas, philosophical ideas, political ideas, uh, ideas of whatever aspect of life. These gods, or this particular god, this spirit, has been influencing people for thousands of years and is, and is sort of revving it up here in the days that you and I live in. You see, you know, we, we, we in this modern, sophisticated world, we look back at ancient history, you know, and say, well, they, they, were, they were superstitious people. They believed in, all, believed in all these myths and legends that were never really true. That, and, but they took it seriously. Where are we at right now as a culture? We're practically doing the same thing. In fact, we've gone way beyond where these people went and whether people take it seriously or not, it doesn't matter. And I, this occurred to me one day, you know, 
the difference between God's true religion and the devil's religion. God's true version of salvation and eternal life is based upon belief. Do you believe? Do you believe? Not just believe anything. Do you believe what God said? Do you believe the record that he gave us in his word? Do you believe that Jesus is the only way? He is the way, the truth, the life. Do you believe that? That's the Christian religion at its core. It's based upon faith. Do you believe? The devil's religion, he doesn't care if you don't believe in anything. He doesn't require that you believe in him. He doesn't require that you believe any truth whatsoever. In fact, his religion is don't believe. Don't believe anything. Just perform the right rituals and then I'll do for you. That's the devil's religion right there. And so you have people that you would, that they would, you'd ask them, are you a, uh, you ask uh, Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana, are you a Satan worshiper? Nah, I'm not a Satan worshiper. I'm just having fun on stage with my horns and my tongue out and my, anyway. But she is. She just doesn't realize it. And there's a spirit working through her, Eminem, rap stars, rock stars, politician or two. That spirit is working there and promoting and pushing the agenda of enthroning Lucifer to be like the Most High and bringing everyone to receiving a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And even these gods of old that for the most part, I mean, let's think about it. For the last hundred years, who really believed in a God called Odin? Probably not very many people at all. But he's back now, isn't he? He's back and he's made quite a bit of money. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? The Thor series. There's Odin. Look at him. Look, look, look. He's got horns coming out of his head. And just, and just stop and think about this now. Let's, let's put the connection here. We know what the false prophet does. He's causing everyone to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead. He's basically sealing them with the mark of the beast. He's saying, once you get this, and the Bible's clear on this, once you take the mark, that's it. There's no turning back. There's no, well, I, I didn't mean to. I mean, they forced me, and they, 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 they did it while I was asleep. They put me in a coma, and I did there's none of that. No, these people are, everybody's making a choice and they're making it right now. Who is leading them to make that choice? The false prophet. How is he doing it? Movies, TV shows, plays, rock and roll music, magazine, comic books. We did that. We dealt with that. We did a series called the Comic Con. And I show you in the Comic Con how all these, uh, a lot of these writers of comic book heroes and legends and things like that, these people were brilliant and very well educated in ways of the occult and gods and goddesses and powers and half gods and half humans and things like that. And that's what they put into their comic books. Where did Thor come from? Where did Thor come from? It came from, he is a god. And Odin, his father, he is the chief of the gods. And he's got two horns coming out of his head. It shows you what spirit is there. It's the spirit of the false prophet. Now, that spirit is not just in Scandinavia or Norway or Northern Europe. That spirit is everywhere. Like I said, it's been around. And here's why I, I mentioned earlier, uh, let's go back to that graphic of the Beatles. And you have um, Paul McCartney making this symbol, and then you have John Lennon making this symbol, all right? Are those two related to one another? And the answer is yes. And I don't ask that you go do a lot of study into Eastern mysticism. You should probably stay away from it. But I have done a little bit of research, and there are some things I know, is that one of the basic ideas of Indian mysticism, Eastern mysticism, this is the practice of yoga or uh, tantrism of some kind or kundalini. They all just sort of blend together. But one of the things, if you've ever noticed someone doing yoga, the common, the most common yoga position is that you wad your, tie your legs up like a pretzel. I can't do that. Tie your legs up like a pretzel and you extend your arms over your knees. And then what do you do with your hands? 
you do this. Why do you have to do that? Well, they tell you that certain hand gestures while you are meditating or practicing your yoga, you can do this, you can do this, you can, you can do this. Certain, and remember the hand being representative of this number five. The hand symbols, Buddha, you'll see Buddha doing different hand symbols. The hand symbols in Eastern and Oriental philosophy, to them it's all important. You're actually attracting or contemplating or you're connecting with a certain type of spiritual force by the hand gesture that you're making. So here is Paul McCartney doing this hand gesture, which is a what's called a mudra in Eastern philosophy, Eastern mystic thought. When you practice yoga, you make certain mudras with your hands. Here's Paul McCartney making this one and John Lennon making this one. So let's look at what this particular symbol means. This is called the Karana Mudra. Kind of sounds like I'm speaking in tongues, doesn't it? Karana Mudra is an important mudra for removing, watch this now, removing obstacles from your life. The obstacles are really mental thoughts and states of mind. For instance, if you're suffering from depression or anxiety, then it would be highly advisable to practice the Karana Mudra. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Here's what the, the Karana Mudra, you make your hand like this. What does that represent? What well, represents two horns? Everybody who's ever made their hand like this says, yeah, that's the horns of the devil. But we know what it is. It's the, the two horns like a lamb coming out of the head of the false prophet. What, are these two, what does this hand mudra, this karana mudra, represent? You've got obstacles in your way, and you're trying to get to a place. So you use the power of this to remove those obstacles out of your way. Now, if you're not catching it, we're actually going to see from the scriptures what this means. But let me just make it simple for you. Here is a buck in the woods, a deer, okay? And he sees, this is, or this is November, and he sees this doe who is looking for a buck, and the buck is looking for a doe. The buck is headed toward the doe, but there is another buck as an obstacle standing in his way, and this buck is saying, that's my doe, and this buck is saying, I bet you a buck it's not. And so what is this buck going to do? Is he going to shoot him? No, that's my job. Is he going to try to kick him? No. Is he going to scare him? No. He's going to use his horns to remove that obstacle out of his way. What do animals that have horns use them for? Dominance. Removing obstacles. And in this case here, it's the obstacles of mental thoughts or states of mind. And you think in sort of a, America has been raised up on sort of a Judeo-Christian mindset that there's one God and that, his, that God has given us his laws in the form of the Ten Commandments. And it actually governs our, our living and our, and our thoughts. And we know that it's wrong to commit adultery. We know it's wrong to commit murder and to steal. We know these things are wrong. Well, as far as the devil's concerned, those are just obstacles to America having a really good time, man. And they're obstacles to getting everybody to go receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead because of the man of sin wants to seal them that way. And so the obstacle that has to be removed, represented by this hand gesture, is the state of mind that there are things that we do that are, that are evil, that are sinful, that are wrong, that are immoral. What does rock and roll teach people? That there really is nothing immoral. You can do whatever you want to do. And even, even if it is sin, well, it's fun sin. 
Rock and roll has had the effect of removing morality from America. Rock and roll did that. The influence of the music and the lyrics and the lifestyles of these people. When, they, when someone says, yeah, he lives like a rock star, we don't automatically think he went to church and he prayed Sunday. That's not what we think, is it? So we know that this symbol, this, this idea has power behind it. It is a spiritual power. It is the power of the false prophet. Now, the word mudra, and I'm probably not saying this right. We have uh, several of our followers that live in India. You can correct me, all right? But the word mudra, I found out what it means. It means a seal. Just like, just like the seal of God being upon God's people, which is the Holy Ghost. So you think you flip it upside down. It's the opposite. It's not the Holy Ghost. It's this particular spirit here that is driving everybody to be sealed by the beast himself by bearing his mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So this idea represents a seal. Notice what the Bible says about this. Job 37, 5. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. For he saith to the snow, be thou on the earth. Likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Look at this. Verse 7, he sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Did you see that? God is the one who seals up the hand of every man. And by the way, I'll just tell it to you the way the Bible does. God already knows who in this world follows God and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and who doesn't. And they already have their appointment with the seal that they are going to receive. Yes, they have a choice in it. And God is already aware of the choice that they make before they even make it. It's not a mystery to him. He understands it. He gets it. And he sealeth up the hand of every man. 2 Timothy 2.19. Here's what the seal of God represents. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Notice, notice now, that the seal of God has a twofold nature to it, just like your Bible. It has an Old Testament and a New Testament. Christ, his first coming, his second coming. Right hand, left hand, right? You know, every, everything like that. It has a double nature to it. Uh, the double portion of the Spirit that Elisha wants to receive when Elijah is taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. You think about that, okay? So the seal of God has this twofold aspect. Number one, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So the seal is God seals his people and he knows them. He didn't make a mistake in sealing any one of his children. He knows them. He knows exactly how they'll turn out. He knows the decisions that they've, they haven't even made yet, and he knows all of them. And so God seals them as his. He knows who his people are. That's the first one. The second one is, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's the other aspect of the seal of God. So let's take this now and flip it upside down, because now we have two horns. And there, it's the mudra that represents the seal. These two horns, you flip it upside down. So look at this first aspect. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And the other, and the, when you flip it upside down, you put it in the beast's, sort of, I guess, the beast world. Is that everyone who receives this mark belongs to the beast. He owns them. He rules over them. He has power over them, just like the seal of God in God's people. The Lord knoweth them that are his. So we, I think that this mark of the beast has an identification attached to it. Some say it's a microchip. Some say, I think it's beyond what microchips are right now, RFID chips. I think it's the next five steps away from what we have right now. That's where we're going. Then the second part of this is, let uh, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Flip it upside down. This is, ah, flip it upside down. This is, after all, the mark of the beast, of the man. Now, just flip that upside down. This is, after all, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So instead of 
God sealing the saints who depart from iniquity. This seal represents the... <laughs> rock and roll for crying out loud. This seal, this sign represents those who have sold out, not just to the devil, but to the man of sin himself and sin itself. Rock stars, they get to do on a daily basis what some people only dream or wish they could do. I mean, my goodness, they've got the money, they've got the power, they've got the influence. They can have a rock concert somewhere where there's green, uh, green M&Ms in this bowl and yellow M&Ms in this bowl. And that's some of the contracts that they sign. It's ridiculous. But they have that kind of power. And they can have money, they can have drugs, liquor, they can have women or men, they can have whatever they want to. They're rock stars. These people are full of sin. And that's one of the horns that I think this false prophet horns represents. In Daniel, here's something that's interesting. The word horn that we have in English um, actually is a derivative. When we, when we use the word horn, like someone's blowing a trumpet, we call that a horn. I played horns when I was in high school. I played trombone, I played a tuba, I played a, a French horn. I did for a while. And so they're called horns. Where did we get that from? We got that, or, or the word cornet. We got that word from how they used to make horns, musical instruments. What did they make them out of? They made them out of literal horns that were from animals. So here's something. I'm just going to throw this in here because I think it's interesting. And in talking about the influence, I believe the Bible is giving us pictures of what's going to happen in the last days and a falling away is going to take place. And here we have in the plain of Dura, we have Nebuchadnezzar who builds an image. Think about it. That's what the false prophet does. And he's 60 cubits tall and six wide. He's seen he sixes there and there. And then he's causing everyone to fall down, to fall and worship this image. What initiates them worshiping this image? Take a look at it. Daniel chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, there it is right there, the first instrument named, the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music. All the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And you know, what stands out here to me is we're still using a horn, a cornet, and that's where the word cornet comes from, horn, still using a horn and its influence on people, music, the musical influence to make people build this image and worship this image and be sealed by the false prophet. That, that day is coming very quickly. Now, let's go back and look at this for a minute because I got something that to me is just interesting. I'm a numbers guy. I like to see the numbers that are in the Bible. And they're, to me, it's absolutely amazing the way God designed everything in this world. Revelation 13, 11, the Bible says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Don't let the idea that he's like a lamb sound or make it sound innocent to you. Because when we think of a, oh, look, a little lamb, no one ever goes running and screaming, honey, a lamb is in the house. No one ever does that. So we think of this lamb and we think it's like this innocent little thing that doesn't hurt anything. And yet, did you know in your Bible that God associates some lambs with wickedness and evil? And I'm talking about like evil lambs. Look at this in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 37. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons and astonishment and in hissing without an inhabitant. They shall roar together like lions. They shall yell as lions whelps. In their heat, I will make their feasts and I will make them drunken that they may rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake, saith the Lord. And I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with he goats. In Psalm 37, 20, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. 
They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. And I want you to get this picture here. This idea that, and here the Bible in two places associating lambs with wicked people. And I want you to think of where this false prophet is headed. Because once he does all of his little stuff on the earth, what happens to him in the end? He's taken and he's cast into the altar of God, which is the lake of fire. That's where he's cast into. So the typology, the foreshadowing, the pictures that you have in the Bible of the high priest taking a lamb or a goat or a ram or an ox. Think of this picture of the European Union of this woman sitting on top of a bull. Well, that's a beast. That's like a god. The, the Israelites worshiped a golden calf, all right? But anyway, the, all these different animals that are taken into the tabernacle, and what happens to them? They're burnt. They're thrown into the fire onto the altar. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of where these beasts are going to be taken. Remember, Peter said about the false prophets in 2 Peter chapter 2, these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and what? Destroyed. Just like when they would bring those animals in and slaughter them and put them on the altar and burn them and burn their flesh. The picture of lambs being taken and burnt is a picture of the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire and all of those who followed after him and were sealed by the very spirit of the Antichrist himself, the man of sin. Just, just kind of ponder that and think about that, all right? Now, something else that I, that I found out about lambs, and I don't raise sheep, all right? So I had to do a little research on this. I had to read some articles and kind of educate myself a little bit. So they always talk about, and in fact, this verse back here talks about, um, uh, I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter. And something that, I mean, it's kind of common knowledge about lambs, is that lambs will always, when there's more than like five or six of them, lambs will always come together and they are just looking for somebody or something to follow. And one of the things I read was, is it like if it's, a, if it's a shepherd, the shepherd, wherever the shepherd goes, all the lambs will all flock together and they will follow that shepherd. In cases where there is no shepherd and all the lambs are together, sometimes it's just a simple nature of whatever lamb moves first, the rest of them just go to follow. So think of Think of all the people on this earth. Somebody is going to lead them somewhere. In the case of those who follow Christ, our gentle shepherd, we know his voice. We know who he is. And where he leads, we'll follow. And if any one of us kind of get behind a little bit and get lost, He'll come after us and take us and put us back in the fold where we belong. That's where we feel most comfortable. That's where we feel the best. There's nothing like having a church service where everybody comes together and they're glad that they're there together. They need that, just like lambs do. Then you got the other, other part of it. You got one lamb of the group. He just decides to take the initiative and go, and then all the other lambs will go with him and then be led as lambs. To the slaughter. My, 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 my. Now, here's, here's something that I think is interesting. Here's actually a picture of a lamb, a ram, and his horns. We've used this illustration before. We have a video called Jesus Christ DNA and the Holy Bible, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time dealing with the this, what they call the sacred spiral or the golden, the golden spiral or God's spiral or whatever. But the Fibonacci sequence, in fact, here's a graphic of it here. Um, the Fibonacci sequence, if you look at this, if you're not familiar with this, let me just kind of give it to you very quickly. Notice the one and the one. Notice the two boxes there, they're the same size. Let's say one inch square. In the sequence, when you add these two numbers, one and one, you get the sum, which is the third number, the number two. One plus one is two. Now, let's do that again, only we're going to move up one. 
When you take the number two and the, and the previous number, number one, and add it together, you get the number three. Coincidentally, that box, that number three box is the same size as the number two box and the number one box put together. It has the same area to it. All right, you follow me so far? Um, then we take the next step. The two plus the three equals five. That's the sequence. You take the size of the two box and the size of the three box, and you're going to get the size of the next box in the sequence. So it's one, one, two, three, five. Three plus five is eight, and five plus eight is 13. And I want you to notice this spiral inside of those boxes. This is called the Fibonacci spiral. And here's something that, well, I'd love to take credit for this. But I can't. My daughter, I was telling her about the Fibonacci sequence and I'm 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And I was talking to her and she interrupted me and she said, that's 33. And I went, what? She said, I just, I don't know, just added the numbers up. 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13. It's 33. And it just kind of matches a, a sequence that you see. It doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is in the universe. Practically everything in the universe has this Fibonacci sequence to it somehow, some way. If you've seen spiral galaxies, you all notice that they'll start out in a, like that inner curl and they widen out as they go around. But even spiral galaxies, they all seem to tail off at exactly the same spot. Usually the number 13 position. So whether it's a spiral galaxy or the water flushing down your toilet bowl, the Fibonacci spiral that's made by that is a sequence of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13. And when those are added together, you have the number 33. Why is that number so important? That's the age of Christ when he was crucified and rose again from the dead. He's the creator. This is, this is his signature on everything in the universe. I love it. Your ear, your ear has a Fibonacci spiral to it. The back of my hair. If you look at the back of my hair, which is kind of thinning out here, but right there's this little spot right here at the top, it's got a Fibonacci spiral to it. Grab your boy and look at the top of his head. It's there. Same spiral, same sequence, same exact signature, the number 33. Now, here's why I brought this up. Look at this. Here's a whirlwind. God spoke out of the whirlwind to Job, didn't he? Same spiral. Notice that it starts out and it sort of fizzes out when it gets to that number 13 spot, doesn't it? Now watch this. Let's go back to these lamb's horns. Same Fibonacci spiral, same sequence, same curl. Each horn representing the number 33. Now think about this, okay? It's, and it may not make a whole lot of sense today, but I promise by the time we get to the end of this, it will, all right? Add, the, add those two numbers together, 33 plus, oh, you know what it is, it's 66. Think about something that has that number, 66. Well, it's part of the number of the beast, 603 score, which is three twenties, that's six, 60, and the number six. There's something else, isn't there? It has 66 things in it. My King James Bible does. But so do all the other Bibles, or I'll say Protestant Bibles. They all have 66 books in them. So that kind of leaves us with a puzzle, doesn't it? I mean, here we have one Bible, and it's got 66 books in it, and they're all named the same way. And here's another translation. It has 66 books in it, and they're all named the same way. Here you have one lamb who is the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And then you here you have another beast that has two horns like a lamb, like a lamb. Do you think this false prophet might try to deceive people who believe in Jesus? There's no doubt in my mind about it. And so the question is, how can we discern between the real lamb and the fake phony lamb? How can we discern between 66 books in one Bible and 66 books in the other? We're going to try to learn that as we go 
uh, through this idea and through this concept and through this teaching, all right, on the, and what really what we're dealing with is the power and the influence that these two horns have, have had in history. That's kind of what we've been looking at. And the power and influence that they have right now leading everyone to go receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Rock and roll music, it's doing it. But there's a lot of other things in this world too associated with this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to expose it. We're going to shine the light of scriptures on this to gain a better understanding of the world that we live in so that we are prepared for these last days. Now I'm going to sign off and, and please, please, if somebody on the internet puts up an image of Mike Hoggard making this, because I've made this sign, I don't know, like 25 times in this video, just write him an email and say, um, come on, if you watch the video, you know Hoggard wasn't trying to flash his Illuminati brethren. Just tell him you like it is, all right? So anyway, we're going to continue with this next week. I've got some pretty interesting things to show you. I think you're going to like it, all right? And I think it'll help you understand really what's going on in this world, all right? So it's been fun today. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.